Hi, meet John. John has been a lawyer practicing in the Washington DC area for over 10 years. He does a little bit of everything, but most of his practice is concentrated in family law. Interesting enough, he wants to spend more time with his family rather than working at the office. Running a law practice is incredibly stressful. For one thing, you have to organize your practice, bring in clients, market to new clients, pay staff, and most of all, practice law. The entire experience can leave exhausted. So if you're like most lawyers, and I mean most lawyers, not huge conglomerate law firm lawyers, but like a real practice where your job is to bring in business but also practice law, the entire experience can leave you frustrated and anxious that you'll miss something. You try to stay on top of things with technology, well, at least you try to. You know how to use WordPerfect, Microsoft Word, a laptop, and you even have a cell phone. So, do you hire more staff? Well, not necessarily. What's the solution? Well, you went to DC Bar 360 and realized that your practice needs to join the 21st century and automate. You listen to the attorneys of Rollins and Chan, a local law firm in Washington, D.C., about the automation of law practice. So what is the automation of law practice? What does it mean to automate your law practice? Automation is the key to client satisfaction, easier workflows, and reducing your overhead. The first level of automation in your law practice is called document automation. Document automation can come in a variety of forms and levels dependent upon your firm type and needs of the firm. An example of document automation is sending a client a standard intake form prior to the initial consultation. In other words, prior to the client coming to the office, they fill out a form on their phone or computer, which you'll receive prior to the meeting. Since the form is filled out prior to the first meeting, you'll have more time to develop a legal strategy or give the person a proper evaluation when you meet. Document automation requires you to use a case management system such as Clio, My Law Firm, Practice Panther, etc. There are at least a half a dozen of them out there on the market. They all operate similar, but just pick one and use it. In this presentation, we're going to talk about using Clio because that's what our firm uses. And so hopefully after the presentation, John can start using and automating his practice. Okay, so stay tuned to learn more about automating your practice. Thank you. So hi, my name is Mark Rollins. I'm an attorney here in DC. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking about automating your law practice as well as marketing your law practice. This program is designed more for a small firm um, or solo practitioner and what it takes to kind of begin to start the automation practice. So we're gonna kind of go through this step by step. The first thing is the automation of marketing your practice. Um, after the automation of your practice, so the next question becomes, what topics are we gonna be covering in this? Uh, obviously, the automation of your law practice, and from there, we're going to go into um, document automation. So what is document automation? And when I mean document automation, there's a lot that can go into that. So, But the first thing we'll start with is the intake of a client. So from the time that you first taken a client, from the when the, the phone rings and he's looking for an attorney to help him with this problem, to the production of the work, until the final conclusion of you've now closed out that case. So document automation, dealing with all three of those processes from the time the client comes in till you start doing the work until the time you close out the case. And that's what I mean by document automation for our purposes. Now, obviously it can mean a lot more things because inside of, uh, we're not gonna go into that into this um, um, talk, but w when I talk about we could actually have production documents inside the case management side of the case, which would be generating documents and things like that. So, but we're just talking about the intake of a case, intake of a client, doing the work, and then closing the case out. So, what is customer relations management software? So, when we're talking about document automation, we're starting with the CRM, and that is dealing with the customer relations management software. Customer relations. Listen to me. Customer relations management software is software that manages the communication between the current and potential clients. So it's just a way of centralizing the communication between you and the clients from the beginning to the end. How does it work? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that happens is your client, the client calls the office, right? And we're not, we'll get into that in the marketing side of this. But the first thing the client does is he, he calls your office, your main number. Um, you may have a call receptionist there. You may be using Call Ruby, or frankly, during the pandemic, you may just be answering the phone yourself. Um, and you say, "Hi, thank you for calling XYZ Law Firm. How can I help you?" Um, yeah, I got this problem. I got a speeding ticket. Uh, can you help me? No problem. We can help you with that. 
I need your contact information, and I know this sounds a little weird, but I need your contact information, your email, and your full name. So you're saying, well, what are you? What is he doing with that information? So I want you to watch. I'm going to go through a presentation on the intake of that information. Okay. Okay. So what exactly are we talking about when we're saying CRM? And we're going to kind of go through that. As you see here, we're going to log on to our system, and this is what your system would look like on the CRM. So this is Clio Grow. This is separate from Clio Manage, but this is for the intake or CRM. So let's pretend that we're entering a new client. I actually put it one in here, but we're going to do another one and we're going to actually enter Mr. John Doe. We actually have to ignore that. We're going to give him an address of john.doe at gmail.com. We come down here. His matter is a, let's say, um, MVA or DMV matter. Um, speeding ticket over 20 miles per hour. Let's do the locations, Washington, DC. The price is 375. The attorney is assigned to it. I could assign another attorney to it, but this is who I'm assigning myself to it. We're going to create the matter. So the client has just called in. He gave me his email address. And now the next question is, where do I go from there? So we have two options. We have a single item. If I wanted to send him just an email, I could just do a single item scheduling email. But because this is a domestic or MVA case, um, traffic case, we already have templates set up for that. So we're going to go over here. We're going to call it a DC DMV case. And my templates, as you can see here, they're now all scheduled. So this one is automatically scheduled. The first thing, which is a uh, welcome email. And and it's just telling him welcome to the firm. So the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to send out an engagement letter. Now the engagement letters are not automatically scheduled because um, you may need to put additional language in there. So we're going to prepare that engagement letter. So as you can see, it's pulling the data, um, DMV matter. I'm going to draft the document. Now these are already drafted. We've already pre-populated letters. This is our engagement letter. Goes into the scope scope of the work. Um, provide traffic. You know, you can add provide traffic consultation. Blah 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 blah. Um, the file retention. You could say, hey, I'm giving you a big discount, so I'm going to cross this out, and now you're going to pay three seventy five. Let's get this messed up. So now we're ready to draft this letter and we're going to prepare it for signing. So this is all taking place inside the CRM. We're now going to, um, we're going to send out that letter and all taking place inside the CRM again, as you can see here, law firm CRM. So the letter is, this is the engagement letter. I need him to sign it. We've already have these things already pre-populated in here. His initials here, initial here, and he's going to sign down here. I could actually sign, put my signature in here if I wanted to, but we're going to leave that alone. We then hit continue. And this is the standard email. Hi, John. You can actually have it say, hi, Mr. Doe. But we have our set for first name. Hi, John. Below is a link to the document. This email then goes out. Um, I can schedule it to remind the client. I was put not now. And so now you can see the DC DMV hearing engagement letter has been sent out. Now, the next thing that we would do is a form. This is a form. It's already pre prepared. So we're just going to send out the DC DMV case. Prepare form. And now that form is prepared. This is what the form looks like. This is the form that he's going to get so that he's going to input all the data in here. So, you know, so it, obviously this is a traffic case. So not much. Uh, not, not much um, details are going into this, just a traffic offense, describing the traffic offense, and then submit. And we're going to put a date in there. But that just kind of shows you what the form looks like. Uh, we're going to continue to the email, and then it says, below John is a link to the document. And again, he gets this form. And we put not now. So that just shows you in a nutshell on two things that are going out. Now, there is additional things that can happen here. but they're not scheduled to happen yet so but this is that this is kind of a a list of things as you would a workflow that should be done on this case the intake of this case 
This is even prior to him being signed up. So here's a, you know, this is a, an email that we may send out upon him signing the engagement letter but not making payment. Thank you, John, for making for signing the engagement letter. And then you can come into our office during these office hours to make payment or you can just pay online. So that just shows you that workflow system of how it would work when you're taking a net client um, as an exp um, working within the CRM. All right. So the next part is actually the meat of the entire automation because that's where you spend most of your time at. And that's dealing with the case management um, of the case. So after you enter, after you begin the case in the CRM, you then are going to export the information to the case management side of the case. And let's take a look at how that works. So now we're in the middle of the case. And now the question is using case management system. Let's go back to our CRM. So this was our CRM on John Doe. Now John Doe unfortunately hasn't filled everything out because he's not a, he's a fictional client. But we now want to move this stuff over to our case management system. Now, like I said, every program is different. So you practice Panther and my case and all these other different softwares, they're all different, but they all have the same mechanism as sort of you're exporting it to the case management side. They're, most of them are separating the CRM from the case management, so there's no confusion. So we're going to export this entire case over to um, the CRM, and we're going to put down our flat fee, and now we're going to export this case into our case management software. Um, as you can see, it's taken a few minutes, but essentially uh, it is now done and we can open it now in Clio Manage. So we went from CRM to now we're going to Clio Manage. And as you can see here, I'm going to sign in again. And this is our case. This is the John Doe that we were working with. So we have John Doe, the client. Had the client filled out the forms, all this information could be populated. So all this information over here would be populated. Um, and we're going to edit the matter because um, not all of the matter did not change over. So we're going to say 2020 uh, DM, DVM, whatever we call it, 00213. And we could actually enter into these different, um, we're going to call it traffic retained. And you can see that all of the information that's going in, going in here, um, we also have additional task automations that these things are, we use them quite often so that every single case, if this, I don't know if we do it on the traffic cases because not much happening, but um, well, yeah, we do. So a DC traffic case, just the automation of the tasks that are generated on that case. We're not going to go into that right now, but we're going to save this. Um, you can see that there's other things on here. Some of this doesn't apply to this case, but we're going to save this matter. And so now this case, let me refresh the screen. This case is now within our um, within our um, our case management system. So everything here, whether we put notes in here, we can put interesting guy, you know, and blah 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 blah. So we can actually add notes to this. Um, if this was not a flat fee, we could actually bill time to the case by just, uh, we could build expenses to the case right here, all within our case management software. Um, and back over to our calendar, we can see that we could calendar events and we could tell John Doe, you know, status hearing, it, DMV, and I usually put the address on here for LaFont Plaza. And I tell him that the court date is going to be that time, 2 o'clock. And I send him a reminder. And then I can put a description. I can add stuff. Don't forget to bring ID. And now once I hit save it, it can send an email notification to him as well. So now he's receiving an email notification of, regarding this event. And so he's aware of the event as well as this calendar is is synced with Google. Or you can have it synced with your Apple iPhone or whatever you use for your calendar. And that they pretty much across the board can use any of them. But it's synced with our Google so that we see it on our phone and we know that that calendar, it, that calendar is now updated. Um, <clears throat> the other big thing, and we're going to create a folder. As you can see here, 
there is Google Drive and we also have Clio. So Google Drive, I we have a large, we, we pay to use G Suites and so every file that we create inside Clio is stored inside uh, Google Drive. But we also will use Clio's actually some of their, um, their storage. And we use this because if we're gonna share a, a document with the client, we will um, do it here. Okay, so if I wanted to put if I wanted to put a document in here, and I'm going to just go ahead and, and load a document, and I'm going to upload a document into Clio. Um, notice it's not coming into Google Drive. If I use Google Drive, that same document could go in Google Drive. It's Clio's link into Google Drive, but it also has its own storage that it also uses. So we just put what my generalized uh, subpoena in here, um, and I could actually. So this is something new that um, Clio's doing, where you can actually sign the document right within Clio. If I had the context information in here, we could sign, we could have them sign that document right here within Clio, just be sent a link. But this document is also kept right here. So just is just a sample document, but that document is now stored inside Clio. If I wanted to share that document with him, I would just John Doe and I'm now sharing that document. So John Doe is actually getting an email sent to him as well, telling him he can now view this document within our portal. And so that also connects him to the case. We usually share most of everything, unless it has a protective order on it, we usually share everything with the client so that they are well aware of what's going on with their case as well. Okay, so I hope that explains that case management side of the case. There's a lot more to it, obviously, because you have all these different options over here and without going into full details, um, like for instance, payments and um, accounts and reports, but there's a, it's a very powerful program. But like I said, this is Clio's framework of their case management side. Every single case management system is gonna be very similar to this and it's gonna operate the same similar way. Most of it is in the cloud. So these this document right here is in the cloud on Clio's portal, I think it's actually shared on Amazon. Um, it is encrypted, so it's not as if you're taking some risk there because this is an encrypted document. You're only taking the risk when you're sharing it because that person can download and share it with somebody else. But for the most part, your documents stored here in this portal are secure and safe. Um, okay, uh, that summarizes our case management side of this. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going back to the close of the case. So we did the intake of the case in the CRM. Then we did the middle of the case, which was done in the case management. And now we're closing out the case, so we're gonna go back to CRM. Let's show, let's see how we do that. Okay. Okay, so now that we finished the case, we started the case with CRM, we did the middle of the case with case management, and now we're coming to the close of the case. So we're gonna go back to our CM, CRM software. And remember, we were working with John Doe. And John Doe, um, we have finished up his case, his case is now closed. Now usually we'll have on here the case closure, but we're gonna select a single item to close out his case. So we're gonna do one, well actually we have a workflow already set up for this. So we're gonna do case closed. And now you can see this is the workflow. It's only two items on our case flow, on, on our case closed item. So the first one is an email case closed with two year follow up. And you're saying, why is it a two year follow up? Because on this specific case, let's just say this was a criminal case, but this is traffic. Um, so it doesn't really apply here, but I'm just showing you for example purposes. That on this particular case, I can send out an email and my email says this, hey, John, thanks for using our services. Uh, we have a welcome video on here, a thank you video. Um, and click here to do a review if you're happy with our services. That's our standard email that goes out if the case was successful, obviously. If we've lost, we may not send that email out. <laughs> but if the case is successful, we send out that email. And then here we have a two-year follow-up, which basically says um, you're eligible. And notice that this email is not going out till August 13, 2022. So that email, without us having to do anything, that email will be sent to him in August 13, 2022. Of course, we won't remember what's happening on that date, but he'll get an email from us saying, hey, John, you know, it's been two years and we're just letting you know that your case is now eligible for sealing and you can start the process. Just give our office a call to start the process for sealing your case. So that's how, that's the reason why we use the CRM when we closed out the case as well. Because obviously you could do that just from going to Gmail and sending them out an email, but this way we know that the case is having a follow-up and that the case is gonna be closed out with a follow-up in two years. And so that's the reason why we use the CRM at the beginning 
In the middle, we use the case management, and at the end, we come back to CRM to close out the case with CRM. So, um, and like I said, if you just wanted to send one single thing out in a CRM, we could just send out case close with two-year follow-up. Um, that's the same um, thing you, you just saw. So we also have drip campaigns. Um, the drip campaign was where you you reached out to him. He hasn't engaged. He hasn't signed. But now you're just going to follow up. So you can do a number of things within the CRM that allows you to kind of keep contact with that client. So this is kind of a new thing, I guess, with law firms in that this is the traditional sales because most salespeople use CRM because it keeps them um, coordinated with their clients and what's happening throughout the process before they actually sell the client. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, if you have any questions, you can always contact us. All right, thank you. So running a law, marketing a law practice, it's probably one of the most difficult things to do is running a um, marketing because you didn't go to law school for marketing. And frankly, but for the internet, I don't know how any of us would do it because um, marketing is a skill all to itself. Um, and I imagine there are business people who go to school for years to learn how to become good at it. But we don't have time to start over and go back to business school. So we have to kind of learn, uh, reading stuff, going to the internet, and studying. So I think it's pretty straightforward that marketing the practice is just like dieting. And take it from a guy who been dieting all my life. It just requires consistency. If you do it consistent, and that means like daily, and you continue to do the stuff, the same stuff over and over again, you have no choice but to get better. Same applies to dieting. So with that said, let's run through some of the stats. So it's more than just referrals now. And when I mean, what I mean by that is that times have changed. It used to be in the past that most people got their uh, clients through referrals from friends or family. But now you can see that 59% of the people that come into a firm and that's coming in as a client, they're coming in, 59% come in as a referral. 16% come in as both, and 57% are searched on their own. Let's break that down a little bit. So the 59% of the sort of the referrals coming in from family, friends, a lawyer, etc. 57% are searching on their own. They're either using a website, search engine, reviews, lawyers, directories, blogs, video, etc. And then online search engine, which is your Google, which owns 80% 80 of the market share there. So 17% is coming from search engine and 17% is coming from a lawyer's website. The potential clients, and all of this data is coming from Clio Legal Trends 2019. It's a, a booklet they put out, I guess, last year sometime um, that discussed most of this information. But potential clients want information. 77% of the clients want to know a lawyer's experience and credentials, also rank the most important. 72% want to know what kind of cases they can handle and they want this information before even calling or talking to the lawyer. 70% want a clear understanding of the legal process and what to expect. That's most of the people who are searching on Google. They're looking to see what the legal process, what they're gonna to have to do to get out of this process. 66% want an estimate of the total cost for their case, and they usually want this upfront as well. And as you can tell, millennials are shifting attention to online. And we always tell people to think Amazon. Amazon kind of revolutionized reviews and putting this stuff out there and basically ranking stuff. Um, and you think Amazon in terms of uh, potential clients. Bringing the client in. The marketing, the practice, it's probably the hardest part of your practice, not even law. It's just marketing the practice to bring in clients. So you, you break that down into several categories. We have the website, we have social media, we have blogging, video blogging, paid per click versus organic, review of the attorney or the practice. So that's essentially marketing your practice and bringing the client in. Most people are bringing their clients in through the website and 57% of the solos have websites. That means, what is that, 43% do not have websites. Solos are still using most of their marketing through email, Facebook, and Avo. Um, these are just some stats that came out of the ABA's trends, and this is just what um, lawyers are sort of marketing towards. But the big thing is that solos generally do not have a budget for marketing. As you can see, 80% of the solos do not have a budget. 
70%, 75% do not have a blog, which by the way, it, those are relatively cheap things to do. If you have no marketing plan, we tell people concentrate on the website first. Let things flow from the website, even your social media, because even when you post something on social media, you generally, those people generally are trying to find out, they want more information. So if you give them something, they're gonna keep looking for more and more information and you want them to come back to you and you have a, a, a home base and that's your website. And that's from the ABA Marketing Trends 2019. So with that said, we go into what's the best way, the best way to build a website. And this is probably, this presentation is probably geared more towards solos and small practitioners. Um, and this is a breakdown of the best website builders out there. So we use WordPress. I'm not saying that that's the way to go. You can see WordPress is the cheapest, but it actually has the highest learning curve as well. So out of all the things that are on there, it's the cheapest, but it also has a high learning curve. Not to say that you can get through law school, you can clearly learn WordPress. It's not even a question. But if you just said, hey, listen, I, I can deal Microsoft, I can do Microsoft Word, I can handle that, you can handle Wix. And frankly, you can handle almost everything on there, Wix, Squarespace, they, they're all kind of operating on what you see is what you get. I think Wix is running, is, is overall the best right now. Claiming your Google My Business account. Um, and if you do nothing else, as it states right here, if you do nothing else, claim Google My Business account. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a no-brainer. In fact, here, if you go to this website, um, and it's also be on the next screen, um, you'll find it right here. It's like I said, if you, the yellow pages, the white pages, it's the same thing. The only difference is, I think the yellow pages used to cost some money. Uh, Google My Business is actually free. It is free to you, and, and literally there is nothing. I mean, don't get it twisted now. Google's trying to get something out of it. You can do your ads through Google My Business. You can do everything on there, but you should claim that. Um, so just, you know, Google is what it is, and you're just going to have to kind of accept it. So what do I mean by Google My Business? The next screen, I'm going to kind of go through this um, quickly, and you'll see what I mean by that. Okay. So what do I mean by Google My Business? So as I stated, Google My Business is just like the old yellow pages or the white pages. It is free. So the mere fact that you, if you don't claim it, you're literally giving it away. You, you're not really in practice for yourself if you haven't claimed Google My Business. I mean, let's face it, Google owns 87% of the search. So people start here. And what do I mean by that? So before my website, and we're just gonna type in, Rollins and Chan. Now notice how I'm not typing in my .com, I'm typing in Rollins and Chan. And you can see here that before anything else comes up, Google makes sure that this, my site, which is, this is not my website, right? This is my website over here. On this side is Google My Business. This is where all the reviews are coming. This is where everything else is coming. So Google is making sure that their product is, is standing out first because this side is my website. This side is Google My Business. So that's just kind of, and the back end of Google My Business is what the back end kind of looks like. So you can actually post in Google My Business. You can put post up. You can, you can put stuff in here. You can add stuff to it. You can add offers. So they're literally making it easy for you to, you don't even have to have a website. You can create a website in Google My Business if you choose to. So you could say, hey, I don't know how to build a website. Go right here um, and you could start your own. So you, you simply would go to Google My Business and that takes you to, you can see this right here and all you have to do is manage now and you'll sign in and it's not automatic so what google is going to do is they want to verify now you don't have to have a physical office space but you may not get into this review here if you don't so you can still do google my business and use a home address and hide your home address from the public and still have google my business so it used to be just that they would only do brick and mortar but now they're actually allowing people to have virtual using your home address it's just not displaying it so there is a way of getting around that so but you should claim this and you should start your process of at least engaging with your customers and trying to get reviews and posting photos and things out there and doing posts you could essentially almost and, and i think google's ultimate evil design i shouldn't call them evil but their their design was to sort of make it so that this product 
can actually bypass you even doing websites because they would want they want you to start blogging and writing posts inside of this Google My Business. So you can do that and you can create more content and put your content directly through Google My Business without even having the website. Now, I still think, and I'm still big on the websites and I think you should have the website because you can do a lot more with the website. But you can see that Google's trying to encroach into that industry. So, like I said, if, you, if you're starting your practice and you're ready to start marketing your practice, start here. They're gonna send you a postcard in the mail, you're gonna register online, they'll send you a postcard to verify that you are who you say you are, and once you do that, you can start the process, they verified you, and they'll get you going. So, just look out for that, and I think that's one of the big things in, in marketing right now. Before you do anything else, I would probably start there. I may even start there before a website, but again, we're big on websites, so. All right, thank you. So, we're gonna end this. Uh, listen, I can talk about marketing until the cows come home because there's just so much to discuss. I mean, you can literally write books and books on this, um, and people have, and I'm by no means an expert. Um, I will just briefly talk about paid per click and versus organic. Um, because some people may not realize that um, when Google is doing their ads at the top of the the top of the search, you'll see an ad beside the name. That's called paid per click. If you scroll further down, where you see the websites but no ad next to them, those are what they call organic searches. Um, it's obvious that paid per click. You could actually spend a lot of money, but you can get to the front of the page on Google overnight and frankly within an hour you get to the front of the page on Google in your in your area of topic so if you were trying to find a divorce lawyer all you have to do is pay to have that word divorce divorce lawyer and you know you pay a notch enough you can get to the top of the uh, the top of the search the other way and the probably the, the the long approach, the consistency approach, is to kind of blog and write stuff and give the information. You know people want the stuff for free. Just give it to them. They want to know how to get a, um, how to pursue child custody, whether they should pursue child custody, just things like that, whether, you know, they'll go to jail for a DUI. They want, the, they want, they ask Google the questions and Google wants to spit back the, out the answer. The trick is never to give them all the information they want because they won't need you if you gave them all the information. And frankly, they probably couldn't do it anyway because you still have to go to court for most of those things. Um, but with that said, there are articles out there. One I think is the best is probably lawyerist.com. They have things on that website that are designed just for small practice and developing your practice and even... I think a video on marketing with lawyers.com. So I would employ you to, to kind of start there. Remember, Rome wasn't built overnight. You're not going to build this overnight as well. Um, it takes a long time. We're still doing it. Um, the pandemic has caused me to learn new areas. Um, so we're actually brought in and out because of different things and things have happened. So um, you can do the same. You can spend your time studying it, learn it, and then um, whether you hire somebody, what they call SEO, search engine optimization specialist, there are people who this is all they do is specialize in this area. You can go out there and hire somebody like that. They do. You can. The problem with that is that uh, people will take you for your money, so because they know that you don't know what you're doing. So before you go out and hire search engine optimization or a specialist, learn it yourself. Learn what they're doing, and then you will have a more of an educated. You can make an uh, educated decision when you decide to hire one of them because if you start marketing, you're going to find that you're going to get something you email every day from some guy telling you that they'll put you on the front of of Google um, within 24 hours. So, but that's not necessarily the best approach. But you'll learn about backlinks and bad backlinks and bad um, black hat tactics and all this. But you'll learn about that by studying it. So before you go out and hire somebody, just make sure. I mean, like I said. We didn't go to business school, or maybe some of you did, but I didn't. So you have to pick up the books, you have to read it, you have to go online, you have to read the articles, um, maybe you talk to experts about how to do it, but start with learning it yourself first and then branch out and have somebody else hire you, hire somebody to help you along the way because you really can't do it all, but you should have a framework of where to start. And like I said, don't forget to claim my business, Google my business. All right, talk to you soon, bye.